<laughs> Welcome to Smash Metafiction. This week, we unearth the pieces of our favorite old stories and stitch them together into a brand new abomination that we like to call Collaboratory. Hosting this thing, my name is Claire Mulcairn. Joining me this week are Dan Mulcairn. Ahoy, mateys! No, it's shipwreck. Never mind. I don't know. <laughs> we're, we're all struggling to find things to say. Kit Mulcairn. I broke a test tube. <laughs> and Miles Schneiderman. No. <laughs> Miles objects to everything, so business as usual. So this is a podcast where we bring in a bunch of pieces of old stories and we try to write a high concept movie together in the style advocated by screenwriting guru Blake Snyder. Each of us has brought a character and then one of us has also brought a setting, one of us has brought a goal, one of us has brought a MacGuffin, and one of us has brought a genre. So now it's time for us to open up our Tupperwares and unwrap that foil and see what everyone brought. So let's see who's going first this week for characters. Uh, I'll go first. My character that I've brought is Beatrice from Much Ado About Nothing. Oh, interesting. interesting. So tell us about what um, archetype Beatrice represents and what it is that you like about this archetype. Well, in terms of her biography, she's a noblewoman, or at the very least, she's the niece of a nobleman. But Beatrice is feisty and snarky and extremely quick-witted and sharp. But at the same time, she's like, she's a very warm and generous and caring person. Yeah, I love Beatrice. She's probably my favorite female Shakespeare character. Cool. Kit, do you want to go next? Sure. Who you got? The Venom symbiote. <laughs> <laughs> Kit, I will, I will say that has been on my short list for MacGuffin since we started. <laughs> <laughs> so Kit, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Venom symbiote and what sort of archetype this represents and uh, wh- why you want to tell a story about it? Oh, because it's fucking dope, Claire. It's fucking dope. It's, a, <laughs> it's the dope for, archetype. For someone in the audience who does not know what this is. <laughs> so the Venom symbiote is an alien life form. It's very goopy. It's like a shiny black. It looks like what you would imagine like nanites, like a goopy nanite kind of machine or creature to be made out of. It just goops its way all around. And in order to do most of its functions, it likes to attach itself to another life form. And it often helps that life form as like a suit. It's classically seen in Spider-Man comics, where it attached to Spider-Man became the cool black suit that he wore for a while. And it kind of affects your brain. The Venom symbiote is not a protagonist. We'll just say that. And uh, Miles, who did you bring for your character? So the character I brought was Carmen Sandiego. Nice. She is the gentleman thief archetype. She's so fucking good at stealing shit and doing crime that like, she just does it for fun. She doesn't have to do it for financial gain anymore. She does it for the challenge. According to one version of her backstory, she was a former agent of Acme, which is like the good quote unquote detective agency in the Carmen San Diego universe. And the reason she turned evil was just because all the criminals sucked and she got bored and she wanted to see if she could beat Acme. That's what I really love about Carmen is that she's just that fucking good. And she's like, I'm not going to go so far as to say that she's honorable, but she kind of thinks of the whole thing as like a game and she respects a worthy opponent. She certainly doesn't do what she does out of greed. She does it out of like a sense of challenging herself. Yeah, because she steals the Portuguese language. Correct. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I, I think I think something that's interesting about that is that because she's just doing this for fun, she can occasionally have surprising moments of like humanity or mercy yes. because this is all just a game for her and it's not like she needs the money. But she's still not like necessarily honorable. She's just kind of whimsical. So the character that I decided to bring this week is Spawn. <laughs> oh, wow. Jeez. What? <laughs> couple of anti-heroes oh boy yeah, and so, and carmen san diego and then there's just this shakespeare character <laughs> <laughs> the the reason i picked spawn and now i will say i'm not like a super fan of spawn um I've, I've seen the movie i've watched the cartoon i've read like a little bit of comics but i'm not like that deep into it from what i understand about spawn uh the basic idea is that he was a sort of like black ops you know secret agent hardened killer badass type dude uh he died he made a deal with the devil so that he could come back to life and see his wife again but the devil sort of owns his soul he got a bunch of superpowers and so basically the idea is that he is on earth sort of 
made a deal with a with a force that he dislikes, that he's fighting against, that he got powers from, that he is not fulfilling his end of the bargain on. And I just like that idea of this person who is like in debt to the bad guys who got a bunch of resources from the bad guys and they're trying to like hunt him down. This is a great cast. <laughs> and now it's time to see what else we brought. So Dan, what did you have to bring this week? Uh, I brought the goal of this movie. The goal I chose was the goal from the film Double Indemnity, which is a 1940s noir thriller. That movie is about there's this woman who makes a ploy with her boyfriend. They both plan to kill the woman's husband in such a way that the woman will get a gigantic life insurance payout. And then the two of them can uh, sort of run off together rich. That's the basic plot. So in my mind, the goal is to commit and subsequently get away with a crime of great severity, (laughs) which is pretty perfect for Carmen Sandiego. Interesting. All right, Kit, what did you bring? In my little Tupperware here. Oh, look at that. It's a MacGuffin. Oh, Oh. (laughs) nice. Oh, it's a, oh God. Well, don't open it too much because it's the motherfucking Ark of the Covenant for Indiana Jones. (laughs) This, wow. this is a spicy meatball right here. <laughs> Tell us about the Ark of the Covenant and the like, the archetype that it represents. All right, so the Ark of the Covenant is some kind of religious thing. And Dan, I didn't pay attention to that part of uh, <laughs> yes. Catholic school. Yeah, it's, it's religious, <laughs> yep. Yeah, um, I forgot what's supposed to be. Oh, it's supposed, it's supposed to have the, the original Ten Commandment. Correct. Uh, tablets. Yeah. Okay, all right, all right. The Catholic school is coming back to me. Okay, <laughs> hold on. And in the movie... The Nazis are after it, and Indiana Jones is trying to stop them from getting it. But ultimately, he and Marianne, is it? Marianne. Yeah, they're uh, tied up to a a stick, and Indiana Jones is like, (laughs) seeing that the Nazis are about to open that thing, and he's like, don't look at it. And obviously, the Nazis open it and look at it, and all of them die in, like, respectively horrible ways, because you can't just look at God things like that. Nah. Get in, you stay in your fucking lane, Nazis. <laughs> so the archetype is the ancient, powerful, religious thing that if you look at it, you face, your face gets melted? Yeah, I just like that idea of a but super it, powerful artifact. But I feel like an important part of the Ark of the Covenant is it's more or less universally desired, but everyone who desires it doesn't recognize that they're putting their own lives at stake by pursuing it. Unless you're Indiana Jones, I guess. Yeah. So Miles, what did you bring for your bonus element? So for uh, my bonus element, I had the setting, and uh, you know, I, I feel like thus far for the setting, people have chosen some some kind of generic things, which I thought is fine. Uh, I wanted to go with something a little bit more specific. My setting that I brought was the Zoo of Death from the book version of The Princess Bride. <laughs> oh, that's terrific, okay. Miles. I've not read the, uh, the Princess Bride book, so why don't you educate me on what the Zoo of Death is and what archetype it represents to you? Okay, so you know how Humperdinck is a great hunter? So in the book, he's a great hunter too. And the Zoo of Death, it's it's kind of, the movie replaced it, I think, with the Pit of Despair. So originally the Zoo of Death is this like thing that Humperdinck built, right? It was like his own little kind of like game reserve. So uh, it had five levels. Uh, the first one had levels that ha- had animals on it that were fast, like cheetahs and hummingbirds. Uh, the second level had creatures that were strong, like rhinos and crocodiles. The third level had poisonous animals. The fourth level had like really scary things. Like um, the Shrieking Tarantula, I believe, was on the fourth level. (laughs) And then the fifth level was empty because the uh, Humperdinck was hoping that at one point he would find a creature as dangerous and powerful as he himself was. uh, And that was going to go on the fifth level. Later, that's the level they used for the machine. And the cool thing about the Zoo of Death is that you can like, there's a bunch of levers and like weird like technology that you can use to like set it up in different ways every time. So every time you run through it, you fight different challenges in different orders because like the rooms change positions and everything. And I love it because I love labyrinths. Um, I think it's a great setting for pretty much any movie. <laughs> God. And I really like this one because of the specificity of the animals on each level, the kind of animals on each level, and the fact that they shift around. It's kind of like Cube, but yeah, I was gonna like, mention, yeah, compared to like Cube, or it's like a little bit, a little bit like Saw, but more complex. Like, sure, I, I think this is a thing that's in a lot of like role playing games or video games. It's like the the mad labyrinth designed by some crazy engineer type person, and it's all it's this test of something. 
I do not, I'm not okay with this uh, animal murder, but it does sound really stupid. <laughs> and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna make it my headcanon that all the animals are Nazis, so it's fine. <laughs> All right, so the Zoo of Death is going to be an important location in this at some point. And uh, finally, I had the genre. And I decided to bring the genre of the fiasco. So this was a genre that was brought to my attention by the uh, role-playing game of the same name, of Fiasco. It's like a specific subgenre. The Coen brothers do a lot, and Mm. there's a lot of other movies that do it as well. But basically, the idea in the Fiasco story is that there's someone who gets an idea for some sort of, like, heist or, you know, get-rich-quick scheme or whatever, and then midway through the story things start to fall apart. And unlike, you know, a heist where it's like everything goes off without a hitch and everything turns out like perfectly just like they anticipated. In the fiasco story, everything goes terribly, like people die (laughs) and randomly like one person may end up with the loot at the end and it might not be the most competent person, you know, like that kind of thing. Reservoir Dogs is another great example of a fiasco movie. Snatch comes to mind, weirdly. Yeah, a lot of that um, Guy Ritchie stuff or whatever, you know. Man, this this is a strangely cohesive bunch of randomness we all brought. Yeah. <laughs> For something that involves Beatrice from Shakespeare and also Spawn, yes. Sure. <laughs> I mean, the characters are a little off, but Carmen San Diego and this heist that we've set up for apparently the Ark of the Covenant, which is being <laughs> held in the Zoo of Death. <laughs> All right, so to run it through, the characters we have are Beatrice, the Venom symbiote, Carmen San Diego, and Spawn. And then we have... Our goal is the goal from Double Indemnity, which is attempting to get away with a difficult to get away with crime. Uh, our MacGuffin is the Ark of the Covenant, which is a ancient, powerful, awesome religious artifact that can melt your brain. Our setting is the Zoo of Death, which is a crazy place with animals and death traps that people really shouldn't go into. <laughs> and uh, finally, our genre is the fiasco, where someone gets an idea for a brilliant crime and it doesn't go well for them. I'm so proud of us, guys. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so now it's time for us to come up with the log line. So we're going to come up with like the sort of one sentence pitch, the elevator pitch for the the broad high concept of our movie. As a reminder, we're trying to come up with a high concept movie, which means that there's some sort of big juxtaposition or fish out of water or role reversal story. The classic movies of the 90s, like Liar Liar, you know, the guy who always lies has to spend 24 hours not lying or like Miss Congeniality, you know, the FBI agent who's really not feminine has to infiltrate a beauty pageant and learn to be feminine, like that kind of thing. So what's a good like high concept for this movie? Well, so if what you're talking about is we are putting a character into a situation that they're not usually comfortable with, I think something that springs to mind is having the one normal character, Beatrice, be sort of our focal point character who is perhaps attempting to pull off some sort of giant theft you know, of, of this yeah. like ancient artifact. And it's interesting because we have a master thief in our cast and we have a couple of supernatural things in our cast. And so I feel like if what we're going with is kind of the weirdest twist on it, then I think it makes sense to have the person who's trying to get away with the crime of stealing the Ark of the Covenant be the one who is the least suited to doing so. Right. It should not be Carmen. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think that uh, it's important to have Beatrice in that sort of central protagonist role because otherwise she uh, is in danger of being kind of lost in the shovel. So I think uh, having her being, you know, kind of the the every person, the every woman in this scenario is the way to go. So one thing that springs to mind for me initially, and I'm not saying this is the way we have to go, but um, if you're familiar with the premise of the movie Smoke and Aces, basically the, the idea in that is that there's a hit that's put out on uh, a guy who's going to like inform on the mob. And there's like a whole bunch of crazy different, there's like, you know, 13 or whatever, something different, like assassins and mercenaries that all go after the bounty at the same time. And they're all trying to kill this guy. And they end up fighting each other and killing each other along the way, trying to get to him. And so this could be like a sort of weird, supernatural combination of that with like Willy Wonka (laughs) in that there's like some sort of labyrinth or death trap thing that a bunch of crazy people all decide to go into to try to get some sort of ultimate prize. But then there's some normal character who also has to go in because of probably like circumstances beyond her control she gets somehow like forced in or it's it's her it's her like last option and she's like way out of her depths you know like trying to compete against these other people. Yeah I like it. Hmm okay. I do have an idea Dan. Yeah. 
if Beatrice's competitors are the motherfucking Carmen San Diego and Spawn, uh-huh. I think the only way that she could maybe uh-huh. <laughs> match them is uh-huh. if she came across this black goop. Maybe, maybe I had that a was similar thought. Maybe that was part of the zoo. Like it was one of the creatures in the zoo, but it binds with Beatrice. Stage one. Goop? Yes. The goop animals? The goop animals. You know, mostly it's just like really shitty lame things like sponges. And- yeah. <laughs> and there's the <laughs> symbiote amongst the sea cucumbers. <laughs> so yeah, it would make sense if like this thing escapes from the zoo in some way and then maybe like finds her. She's living in like real life and hasn't ventured into it yet. And it bonds with her and it either like convinces her that she needs to go do this. It like tells her that there's some great reason why she has to go on this quest or alternatively, like she has to go on this quest to try to get this thing removed from her or something like that. How how do we feel about that? I'm just imagining like fucking Benedict coming up and giving her shit for being female and the symbiote just like punching him in the face. (laughs) Yeah, just like (laughs) this like four foot long tongue comes out of her mouth. The symbiote bites the fucking top half of his head off. (laughs) (laughs) That is one way we can do it, Claire. What that would mean then is her getting the symbiote is sort of like part of the setup and then like the story really begins when she gets to the zoo of death and starts competing with these other thieves the other way we can do it is she gets to the zoo of death starts competing with the other thieves and then like early in act one she runs into the symbiote which bonds with her and so like she doesn't start off this competition with an edge of any kind you know she's sort of going in a little more desperate and her getting the symbiote is kind of part of the plot i want to make sure we're doing it in the in Claire's fiasco genre. So I'm curious as to what works better. The symbiote finding her, say it's in a weakened state and it bonds to her to like save its own life. And then it's like, now we're in this together because you have to help me get the Ark of the Covenant for some reason and then I'll leave you alone. Or do we think it's more in tune with that genre for there to be some other reason for her to be trying to get the thing the Ark of the Covenant, and her just kind of run into the symbiote in the zoo. Like, which works better in the genre? The other thing that I just want to point out, and this is this is kind of like along the same lines, is her ultimate goal has to be committing a crime we, and to get away with it. So I think the way that we can embody that is whatever the stated goal of this contest is, she's not doing that. She has a different motivation than everyone else. Mm. It would be like if, if the goal is to like, if you get this thing, like whatever, you get the magic wish granted or you get whatever, she would like want to like destroy it or that kind of thing you know what i mean she's wanting to not follow the rules she's she's stealing it and giving it to slugworth or whatever what if they were in, instead of being in competition what if they were like on a team like what if they for some reason were the heist gang or the the fiasco gang okay like all of them are working together or something like that right but that, they all have they all have individual agendas and they're working yeah. against one another in secret i think we need to nail down some of the specifics then so we should figure out either what the object is what the yeah. zoo of death is and or like what this whole setup is. Cause like we've right. talked about it being a contest, but I also think it could just be a heist where it's sort of like, you know, there's this like great ancient historical treasure that's on display in a museum for a certain period of time. And it has unintentionally become a target for several criminals that are racing each other to get to it. Yeah. So I think the thing is, if this is some sort of like complex that has like traps and mutant animal monsters and stuff in it, then it seems like it should either be one, it could be created by like a government and this would be like some sort of like a Hunger Games type scenario. Or alternatively, this is created by some sort of rich, eccentric madman who lives on the fringes of society in some way, like a like a Willy Wonka type or whatever. I kind of like the idea of it being the property of one eccentric person who has collected a bunch of rare and dangerous creatures and objects from all over the place. And the Ark of the Covenant is like his most recently acquired crown jewel that he has put in the fifth room or on the fifth floor. You know, it's like this has completed his collection because it's so dangerous and so valuable. And as a result, all of these other people want to get to it, but they have to get through everything else that's really rare and dangerous that he's collected in the process. Hmm, I like that. I like it too. Does does Spawn's archetype align with this goal? Because I know Carmen San Diego's works, but what about Spawn? Yeah, so I think the way you can go with Spawn is you can either have him be also attempting to get this thing, or he could be like working for this person, but just in some way he has to be like bonded to serve some greater force that he doesn't really want to be serving. Uh, you know what I mean? Yes. Like, uh-huh. 
so he's kind of, he's sort of like reluctantly working for something or either that or he abandoned working for something. What like one thing you could do is you could have it be that he used to be like some sort of security guard who worked for this place or, you know, he was like loyal to this guy and he stole a bunch of stuff, like some item or something. And now he's like turned against that dude and wants to like break back in and steal stuff. And maybe he like knows the layout of the place. And then so the person who runs it has like a grudge against him. I definitely think Spawn should be the person assembling the team if we do a team. I liked your idea of him knowing the layout. So like, cause, cause you always have that guy, the guy who puts the team together is like, no, it's okay. What I bring to the table is I've been there. If like the power that, that spawn stole was the symbiote thing. What if it like bonds to Beatrice, but he stole it for himself, but did, oh, it never like actually that. bonded to him. Mm. That's good. So That's then like, good. he has to bring her along, even though he doesn't want to, because she's the one with like the powers. So what I'm thinking is our setting is the Zoo of Death, but we don't have much of a setting beyond that. The Zoo of Death is from a fantasy story, though. So do we want to say that this is a fantasy story where it's like this is in like a castle somewhere and the surrounding area is sort of like quasi medieval and like... I mean, I think these archetypes translate really well to that. How about like, what if we did like early 20th century pulp? This person who has these things is like an archaeologist who's like, this is like sort of age of adventure, two-fisted, like Indiana. A Jones ish kind of stuff. So, all of the weird monsters and death traps and stuff that he brought back are from like darkest Africa and like the lost ocean or something. Right. It's like he has stuff from like Atlantis and whatever. Like, it's, it'd be like those kinds of ancient civilizations and stuff like that. I think that ties in with the Ark of the Covenant thing a little bit. And I don't know, it just makes it a little bit more like of a specific film genre that I can wrap my mind around a little bit more. It's, this is like the same genre as like The Mummy or whatever, you know? Okay, like, yeah, okay. I'm fine, with, I'm fine with that. All right, all right. We can even uh, have the different levels in the zoo sort of correspond to different cultures, you know? So like there's oh, yeah. the Egyptian floor where there's like a bunch of mummies and like crazy flesh-eating oh. scarabs and stuff. Oh, I like are, that. Oh, are we not doing the specific types of animals? Because that's so stupid. I mean, we can- it's we can. So I mean, we stupid. can if you want to, yeah. but I, we well, can always change it up. Yeah, I don't think we need to have the same exact levels because like, I mean, once again, it's the archetype of the zoo. I, I like the idea of it being like this level is like- like all scarabs and, you know, jackal men. And then the next level down, you're fighting like gorgons and minotaurs or whatever, you know? Yeah, like. yeah, yeah. Okay, so essentially then the plot is... The log line. Yeah. Right, the log line is there's an old retiring archaeologist who has recently concluded his career having collected an item of singular value and danger, which he has placed at the bottom of this crazy maze filled with a bunch of monsters and traps that he has collected yeah. over the course of his career. He's like an eccentric former adventurer. Sure. So one of his former associates or servants or guards or what have you, Spawn, mm -hmm. happened to acquire an object of power or a some sort of symbiotic creature of power and is intending to, having been slighted by the archaeologist or perhaps just greedy, decides to gather together a team of thieves in order to steal the Ark of the Covenant out from under the archaeologist. Do you want to have Spawn's motives be noble or selfish? I think we want Spawn and Carmen Sandiego to be wanting to get rich off of this thing, and then Beatrice, like, wants to destroy it, maybe. I agree. Okay. I think that that's what's going to okay. lead to the fiasco, is if people I'm have selfish motives. And I think the I think the symbiote is still loyal to the, the eccentric adventurer, personally. Well, what if he, the symbiote wants to kill the archaeologist? Because the archaeologist captured him, right? Like, it, it kidnapped the symbiote. And so sure. everyone else kind of wants to get in and get out without being seen, and preferably without having to murder anyone. But the symbiote is planning to kill this guy if he gets the chance. Mm, what if Carmen Sandiego is still Carmen Sandiego and that she just wants, like, the biggest thrill of her life, and that's her kind of selfish motive for wanting to steal this thing? Sure. Yeah. But the symbiote knows through whatever mystical goopy means that there is great power that it just seeks within this like arc. Yeah. I, I'm just not feeling the revenge thing for the symbiote. I mean, revenge is kind of the symbiote's bag though. I think that's because it attaches to people who want, who are like, want revenge. I think the symbiote in itself is a little bit more just like primal. Okay. This is what I'm thinking. The treasure, the Ark of the Covenant is a, uh, a meteorite. It's a fragment of space rock which is impossibly rare and singular on this planet. It is from this rock that the symbiote came. In acquiring the rock, the archaeologist had to betray Spawn, who was his adventuring partner. 
And mm-hmm. so he betrayed Spawn, maybe even like left him to die somewhere and stole this uh, rock. But Spawn survived because in the meteorite was the symbiote, which came to him. And so the symbiote wants to use the rock to maybe like merge with it. Like maybe there's a greater part of itself within the meteorite and it feels like it needs to complete itself. Spawn wants to get revenge and Carmen Sandiego wants the thrill. So... How is the meteorite like the Ark of the Covenant besides being a MacGuffin? It's an ancient object which is desired by many and holds great danger. Maybe there's like great power that's inside or maybe like the rest of the symbiote is inside and the symbiote that got out is just a like a tiny piece of it. I think it. I, one thing that would make it a little bit more similar to the Ark of the Covenant is if it was like a piece of alien machinery that crashed to Earth. So it's it's not just like a rock, but like- It there's, could be a ship. Like, yeah, like a piece of an alien spaceship or something like that could be. Because I like the idea that it like connects you in some way to some greater power. Maybe there's like a computer in it that can like drive you mad if you like try to interface with it. It like can psychically interface with you. A little bit like the monolith or whatever. But I do want this to feel like the Ark of the Covenant. I, I want to feel like like ancient man thought this was like a god thing. Yeah, totally. Well, yeah. what I like about it is, because if we set it up so that the zoo of death is divided not by the traits that the animals have, but by what culture it came from, it's sort of like, we have the Egypt level, and we have the ancient Greece level, and we have like the Babylonian level or whatever. And then at the very bottom, there's one level set aside for like secrets from the stars. And this is the one thing that this guy has, is mm, this ship yeah. that he found. Okay. This could also be like the Atlantis level, you know, like maybe sure. you could do something it's like an that. an ancient so, Atlantean yeah. treasure or something. We yeah. could also say something like, um, the ship has been on Earth for centuries, but no one's ever figured out a way to open it. Like, and it's been it's been passed down and, like, worshipped by various people, but the adventure dude finally figured out how to open it up and then captured the thing inside. Do we want to say that he figured out how to open it up? Because my impression is that, like, you know, if we're making this a parallel to the Ark of the Covenant, then opening it will destroy the person that opens it. So I was thinking maybe he just takes it, thinking he will open it eventually. I guess my question is, where did the Venom symbiote come from if the thing never opens? I like the idea that the Venom symbiote is the key to opening it. Like, if someone is bound with it, then they can, like, interface with it and not get their mind destroyed. Oh, I like that. So he found them separately. They found the Ark of the Covenant a long time ago, and they brought it back to their base. And then him and Spawn found the symbiote, and then Spawn betrayed him and stole the symbiote and left, and now wants to, like, do this heist against him, you know, to, with the symbiote. But it, but and it, so it can only, like, bond to one person, and it's kind of, like, bonded to you forever. And it bonds this other lady before, and so he has to bring her along, even though he doesn't want to Because you need the two things together. Yeah. Cool. Okay, I yeah, like that. I think that makes sense. So Beatrice's goal is to get to the ship because then the symbiote will leave her and she can get back to her life. Yeah, or at least like it's told her that it will or whatever. You know, that's right. her impression but that, going that's in. what she's thinking it is. She's yeah. so tired of craving brains. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Beatrice in the play was a noble woman. So do we maybe want to say that you know, she's like a high society lady? <laughs> like, sure. an air, like an heiress. An yeah. heiress. Yeah. yeah, that's real good. And she gets infected with the Venom symbiote. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, our logline is, okay, this is very hard to explain. A rich heiress bonds with a strange, mysterious organism and has to go on a quest with a pair of bad thief people to try to uh, get an item that will help rid her of her curse. Cool, so now we got to work through the beat sheet. We have 12 different beats to get through. They are going to be opening image, theme stated, catalyst, break into act two, B story, fun and games, midpoint, bad guys close in, all is lost, break into act three, finale, and closing image. So the first one is the opening image. So the idea for this is we open on who our character is and what they want. They're in some sort of relatively stable situation, but there's also something that needs fixing in their life. Generally, they need to learn some sort of lesson as well. I think it's pretty clear that Beatrice is, like, totally bored with this whole heiress thing. Yeah. We can see a scene of her totally verbally dismantling some, like, idiot suitors or, you know, yeah. some some other people sort of from her social strata that she's clearly, like, the intellectual superior to, but she's just sort of, like, stuck in this life where she has to put up with these brain-dead people. Yeah, it's I, a real Princess Jasmine situation. Really I was is. about to make that parallel. She probably, like, sneaks away to go to, like, I guess, speakeasies? <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> Absolutely. So, she sneaks away to listen to jazz. You know what? I, that's where she should run into Spawn and accidentally get exposed to the symbiote too. Yeah, in like a, a crimey, a crimey sort of place. Yeah. Oh, um, I love it. Okay, but so yeah, she's living this life with these this sort of stuff going on. The next thing we have is that at some point our theme needs to be stated. So what this means is there's a character who needs to either say what the lesson is that we're going to learn, or they need just so many state the exact opposite of the lesson that we're going to learn, because by the end, these words that they say are going to be proved wrong one way or the other. So what do you guys think our theme is? Um, <laughs> is this about like the pursuit of power and like the fetishization of it? There could also be like the forbidden knowledge stuff. So. It, yeah, it depends. Because if Beatrice is our main character, her struggle is about the boring status quo versus a life of adventure. What if early on her boring uncle tells her, well, I know that you want to go out and... Ad- Man, this is the same theme from the freaking first collaboratory that we did. Oh, yeah. Ah, this is not going to be very similar in other ways, I don't think. That's but. that's fair. <laughs> I mean, we do, have a, we do have a lady who makes friends with a monster, but... Yeah, this is just what our studio does, apparently. I mean, it's okay to have a brand, Dan. Uh, but, but yeah, like a theme that's central to Beatrice, if she's our main character, would be about breaking free of a stable but boring lifestyle in order to go into a a less predictable but more fulfilling sort of adventurous life. Yeah, I like that. Oftentimes, your villain has the same sort of goal or philosophy as the hero, but pushed to a much more extreme degree. So I think that the more extreme version of this is wanting to like, maybe, you know, connect your mind to like ancient deities and like break out of the mundane reality and like achieve a connection with like the spiritual and that kind of thing, you know? Well, so the difference between her and the archaeologist, I feel like, is the archaeologist goes out to these exotic places, but then he brings them back and puts them in a box. Oh, yeah, that's true. Tries to control them and not just experience them. For, yeah. He's about controlling the unexpected. Or he's he's right. about controlling the wild, right? There there was actually a quote from Terry Crews that I heard. And I don't know if it was him originally, but I heard him say it that I thought, which is, you cannot love someone and control them at the same time. Totally. So Mm. I I think it's about that because she is someone who is being controlled. And so she breaks out of it. Just like the the symbiote was being controlled and Spawn was being controlled by this guy who like had them in these like unhealthy dominating relationships. And so they turned against him. What's a thing that a character would say in this opening, a character would say to Beatrice that would like be one side of this theme stated? I mean, I kind of like what you said with the Terry Crews thing. We could have them say like, we're controlling you because we love you. We need to protect you. You're so valuable. That kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Maybe she's not just any heiress. She's the last child of the family. So one last thing before the catalyst. Does our main character save a cat? I'm wondering if this might be the one time they don't. No, they have to save well, a cat. Well, what's, what's, her, what's her like defining moment as a character that makes us go, I like this character. This character's cool. I mean, I, I feel like it's dressing down a suitor and like sneaking out to go to a jazz bar. Does she kill it on the, on the jazz sax? <laughs> well, I was going to say, maybe she like... She saves the cool cat spirit of the jazz age. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I mean, Daddy O? No one said the cat wow. had to be literal. <laughs> yeah. Maybe the bar she goes to is like the jazz cat or something. That's our other, our studio's other thing is there's always a cat like somewhere. That. Always a she, cat somewhere. Oh, it's like, it's try, like try good? <laughs> yeah. She like secretly donates like a lot of money. She like throws a, a whole bunch of money into like a tip jar or something. Right. She like, saves the cat from foreclosure. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Now it is time for the catalyst. This is the part where they're, the big crazy event shows up in our character's life that takes them out of their like normal world and uh, introduces them into the new world that will be Act 2 eventually. What is the catalyst that comes along into our character's life? I mean, clearly it's the symbiote bonding with our character. Do we want to say that like Spawn, he's at this club and he has this case and it gets like destroyed or something if it's in some if it's like in a you know a glass bottle or a case or something and it gets like broken or it falls over and it like comes out and it's gonna bond with somebody and she like pushes them aside and is trying to get them out of the way of it and it bonds with her but she's doing it to like try to like save someone oh i like that i feel like spawn should be holding his meeting with his heist gang in the basement of the speakeasy which is why yeah. he's there oh dude the speakeasy should be called the cat's meow well, it, it was Absolutely. the jazz cat. Is what... The jazz cat's so lame. Okay, fine. The cat's pajamas. Oh, I like the cat's pajamas because it's a nightclub. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, I like it. <laughs> so like, I'm imagining Jesus the opening Christ. of this movie being like kind of scenes of Beatrice's like mundane ass life 
like kind of interspersed with Spawn gathering the crew. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is the last step before Act Two. So yeah, they should. He should be meeting up with Carmen San Diego, and then they can also have a few other like generic random people that are gonna die in traps, so that we know that there are sure. traps. Yeah, so about a dozen red shirts. Fucking Sean Beans around here somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all Sean Beans. <laughs> Yeah, so we can say that this thing bonds with her. Do we want to say that maybe we have a little bit of a scene here where Spawn and Carmen San Diego are trying to chase her down because they like need to get it back and she's like freaking out and not knowing what's going on. And like there's like a fight or chase scene through the streets and maybe like she ends up manifesting some powers at the end and like knocks them all away and like beats them up or something. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. You got to have that that kind of like pyrotechnic, I'm discovering my own powers. Like, we don't want it to be that Spawn brings her into the basement and is like, okay, you have these powers. Like, we want to see her use the powers. Probably then at the end, she like, after using the powers, she probably like passes out or something, you know? And then like maybe wakes up in like captivity of them or something like that. I I definitely feel like there should be, yeah, the scene where she she's holding everybody off and then she passes out because she doesn't know what's going on. She's in shock. All right, so now we have the break into Act 2, where our character is leaving their normal world, and they're traveling into a new world. And oftentimes, there's some sort of symbolic crossing of a threshold that they can't come back from at this stage, and they're now moving into the main arena of action where most of the story's events are going to be taking place. So uh, what are we thinking this looks like in Break into Act 2? So basically, Spawn and Carmen San Diego tell her about their plan to go steal this spaceship from the basement in this giant dungeon that this rich archaeologist has in his mansion on the edge of town. And they say that the ship is the only way that Beatrice can become unbonded from this symbiote, and that she's also going to be very helpful to them if she comes along. So she agrees to go, not so much because she wants to help them, but because she wants to get unbonded, because she hasn't quite connected with the whole theme yet. But she will, yeah. especially when she sees how much Carmen San Diego loves adventuring, which I'm kind of thinking is going to be become her role model. Uh, yeah, I think she, I think she should also not be totally okay with having the Venom symbiote. On, oh, I think she on. should be very not okay yeah. with it, which is because like her whole motivation, yeah. at least in the beginning, needs to be she wants to get to this ship so that the symbiote will leave her. Right, it's like this thing is going to affect her mind, and I mean sometimes it's hard it's hard to notice at first, but I feel like she should notice that this thing is making her kind of crazy. Do you think it's like trying? It's like talking to her and oh, like yeah, telling absolutely. her to come with it. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, I think having having visions and uh, hearing voices, all that kind of stuff. So and that works out because I would was wondering why Spawn hadn't bonded with it yet. And it might be because when you get bonded with it, there's only a certain amount of time before you go crazy. And so like yeah. he was holding it off until right before they go in and then he was going to open it up and bond with it. She sort of like pushed them to act early. Because they're like, okay, if we don't do this now, then we're never going to be able to do this. I I also like the idea that they are really underselling her on the danger that they're going into. They're (laughs) like, we're going to go like steal this thing from this guy. And it's not that well guarded, you know, and we'll be protecting you. There's like a spider. (laughs) It's just one spider. It's fine. So now they need to start entering this like the zoo thing. So where is it? Like, do we think, is it in a city? Is it in the wilderness? What does it look like? You know, what's like the scene of them approaching it and going into it? Is it are there, like guards outside? Like what, what's the deal? Well, you guys made it sound like it was underground. I think that's the yeah. way to go. Make it like a dungeon. Yeah. Underground is what it was in the book. Yeah. I think, I think you can like start off at like, uh, like as like, it's like a ground level structure, but then they just keep going downstairs. But there should be like a portion of it that's like above ground that looks like, is like a cool looking building. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's like in the dude's mansion. He has this big rambling structure on the edge of town and you know, there's like a secret passage on the ground floor that leads to the first level of the zoo of death. Oh, I was thinking if this is, if he's a, if this dude's like a rich folk, he probably got a real nice house like in the middle of some woods or some shit. Yeah, it's like could out be that in the middle too. of nowhere. It, it'd actually be fun if this guy's like a, a famous rich high society type, if her family knows his family. Like, yeah. you know, she's she's they're kind of vaguely aware of each other. That could be fun. Definitely. When they approach, do they like sneak in all secret like? Do they barge in the front door and start shooting people? What are we feeling like? You know what I was thinking? If this archaeologist is the high society type, Maybe he's like, he's having like a ball or something at his mansion and they decide to leverage Beatrice's high society-ness to get in. You know, she's sort of providing cover for them while the team like locates the entrance to the zoo of death or is like, you know, trying to pick the lock or something. And so she has to actually like have a conversation with the archaeologist for a bit where she's like trying to cover for them. And he recognizes her because, you know, he's friends with her family or whatever. Yeah, she's having to kind of lie to him about why she's there. We can play up the themes of, you know, like the high society and like controlling the uncontrollable and that sort of thing. I also like the idea that during this scene where she's 
she's supposed to be like the face of the party and have to lie to everybody. She's like seeing hallucinations and hearing voices and yeah. saying weird shit. Yes, like in absolutely. the middle of like, and like her hands are like twitching. Her powers are manifesting a little bit every once in a while. Like, I think that'd be really cool. Yes. So. Right. And now where are the other two while this is happening? I'm thinking because Carmen has to be working on how to get in, right? So Spawn would know the layout of the place. So I'm thinking he takes Carmen to the entrance and she's like picking the lock or something. Right. Doing whatever she does. Uh, Carmen is stealing every lock in the fucking (laughs) building. (laughs) She steals the lock from the door and then they can go in. Exactly. Once they make it into the the zoo proper, the basement, does the guy know that they're in there and like, you know, flip a switch and trap them in there kind of thing? Yes. Why wouldn't you do that? Do you think she, like, accidentally gives them away? Because she has a vision or whatever at the wrong time? We have to remember that this is a fiasco, so yes. <laughs> they, like, open up the vault, or they're about to open up the vault, and then she manifests her powers and, like, attacks a whole bunch of people. And then, like, all of his guards turn on her, and it turns into, like, a big, like, shootout. And then they run to, like, the entrance of the vault, and Carmen San Diego's still, like, opening it, and then, like, opens it at the last second, and they all go in and close the door. Cool. So they lock themselves into the zoo of death. And maybe there's other entrances in so that the guy can be like sending in guards or minions after them or something like that. Now we are at the B story. As we're proceeding onward, we're going to get the first inklings of some sort of secondary story that's going on. Oftentimes it's an interpersonal story, like a romance or a friendship that develops over the course of it. One of the characters has a prominent subplot or arc that comes out. So what what are we thinking for this prominent uh, like subplot or arc? So if our theme is about being contained and safe versus exploring the big, bad, dangerous world, Carmen Sandiego is the sort of person who's already embraced exploring the big, bad, dangerous world. So we could have Beatrice and Carmen having a talk about what Carmen's motivation is, and Beatrice begins to think about how Carmen is the sort of person who just goes out and has adventures because she wants to. I like that, especially because they're both female characters. Yeah, so totally. It's kind of like a thing where, like, wait a minute, like, what do you mean they didn't make you get married? And Carmen's like, oh, they tried, you know, all yeah. that yeah, kind of yeah, stuff, yeah. right? I especially like that because I'm like, not, again, not to skip ahead, but I'm pretty sure Carmen needs to die later. No! So that'll, cre- that'll create <laughs> some death. No, I was just happen. about to recommend that they should wind up together at the end. <laughs> And we're not going to kill our gays this time. We're going to let the lesbians have you happy, happily ever okay, after, stealing I... the Portuguese language. <laughs> okay, <but> first of <laughs> they all... They off into, un- into the sunset together with the Portuguese language <laughs> in the backseat of their car. First of all, when I suggested this, they weren't a couple. <laughs> I know. Second, so I'm not responsible for that. Second of all, I really think it's important for the fiasco genre. I feel like the person who's the best at doing the crime needs to get Get no, death trapped. I don't want a hetero couple. And I want a couple. There doesn't need. Who says there needs to be a couple at all? Me and Bob. The spirit of Bob. <laughs> I, we can, Bob's not here. Miles, we can kill Spawn later. How's that? Oh, no, that, I, that makes Spawn me sad doesn't too. matter. Makes me sad too. How dare you say my character doesn't matter and your character I mean, matters. not in that role. I don't. Isn't Spawn black? I don't want to kill the black person either. <laughs> Oh my god. Damn it. Uh, so basically right, you just don't want to do the fiasco genre. I know. We're going to kill 12 Sean Beans <laughs> and then everyone else lives. Yeah, my character I, is 12 Sean Beans. <laughs> we we will know. have this debate during Act 3. Yeah, let's, right, let's not good. jump the gun on who we're killing. I do like the idea of, of the B story is the budding relationship, whether romantic or not, between Carmen Sandiego and Beatrice. Yes. The budding poly relationship. <laughs> Between right, Beatrice good. and 12 Sean Beans. <laughs> <laughs> she has to watch all of them die. The- okay, maybe this is just an, uh, a pro-ace movie. <laughs> no romance. This is what it. happens when you try to get into any romance at all. That's the message we're sending. <laughs> Everyone dies. Now we're at the fun and game section. Uh, this is the first half of Act 2. This is the part where the movie is the movie. Whatever you're seeing on the poster or in the trailers, we're doing all that kind of stuff here. This is, I think, supposed to be like action, fighting monsters, getting past traps, all that kind of stuff. So I think this is the section of the movie yeah. where the, the greatest percentage of that is happening. So there are there any key scenes that are, are spring to mind that you guys want to include in this section? Yeah, they have to fight a spider with a knife. <laughs> Nothing the scary. spider has a knife or they have what? a knife? The spider has a knife. <laughs> I like the idea of doing everything themed by like pulp villains. So like Egyptian shit and Greek shit. Yeah, totally. Definitely they're going through these themed levels. I think maybe the archaeologist and his like guards are like a few levels behind them. So, you know, like by the time 
our heroes finish the third level, they finally manage to get the vault door open and they start like following behind them. You sure. know, as, as a way of sort of like keeping the, the tension up. Yeah, I'm thinking like they're almost through the Egyptian level when like Carmen decides to steal a fucking scarab from a sarcophagus. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> and everybody's like, what are you doing? So she does the Abu thing. A lot of Aladdin shit in this movie. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is this is where we start killing off our non-essential NPCs. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. We're losing Sean's bean. At some point, they need to fight a sphinx that, like, asks them riddles, and if they get them wrong, it, like, eats them. Yes. Oh, God, yeah. And Beatrice comes up with the last answer. Yeah. I feel like Beatrice should kind of be, like, not necessarily a badass during this bit. Yeah. Like, she can do her part, but, like, she's still kind of more freaked out by the fact that we're fighting lion dragons or whatever a sphinx is, you know, <laughs> than anything else. So it's like, when she contributes and, like, does something like answer that last riddle, it's a big deal. I kind of yeah, feel I like it, she shouldn't come up with the answer to the last riddle. She should trick the sphinx into revealing what the answer is. Because she's oh, that's so oh, yeah. witty. Yeah, yeah. I like that better. She has, like, that sort of, like, interpersonal manipulation kind of skills are her, like, Right, she's not a deal, puzzle so. solver. She's right. a... She's just really good at dismantling people verbally. So now the midpoint. Uh, so the midpoint is a bit of a tricky section. Up until now, things have been fun and games, but here's where things get a little bit more serious. There's some sort of plot twist or change in the action to keep the second act from getting stale. It can take one of two forms. In a dramatic story where they have a lesson to learn, the midpoint is where they have an experience that plants the seeds that will later like blossom into this lesson. And sometimes they have a chance to like to make the final decision, but they make it wrong here because they're not quite there yet. This is in a Christmas story. This is where Scrooge sees like Tiny Tim suffering in the present, or in a more just like like action oriented external kind of story. The midpoint is when there's some sort of large complication that they have to deal with in addition to the stuff they've been dealing with so far. Like in Back to the Future, this is the part where Marty realizes that his siblings are disappearing from his photograph so that in addition to trying to get home, he also has to make his parents fall in love. So what are we feeling for our midpoint? Because of like the theme that we're working with, I feel like the midpoint is they've gotten to the most dangerous part of the zoo and they're fighting some like badass monster and things are going really bad. And the only way they're saved again is for Beatrice to kind of like give in to the symbiote briefly. She loses herself in the in the sort of animalistic madness of the symbiote. Yeah, because the lesson that we're working with is that you want to be kind of leaning into this weird shit, right? The lesson, if it's about control, it could be about forcing the symbiote to manifest its powers and do things it doesn't want to do. Because, like, if the the ultimate lesson is that you have to, like, kind of let things go and not try to control them and, like, experience them but not want to own them. So it could maybe be, like, her using the symbiote the way that other people want to use it. So, Claire, looking ahead, is the next one bad guys close in? Yeah, that's the mirror of fun and games. This is the where th bad things are happening. I have an idea for this. It does kind of change the way that the characters' relationships work with each other. So Spawn is in it for revenge because he was like the archaeologist's adventuring partner and he was betrayed and sort of like cut out of the deal. Which means then that Spawn before that had the same motivations as the archaeologist. Like, he was the yeah. sort of guy who would still collect things and, like, keep them in boxes for his own glory. So I'm thinking that maybe once they get past the hardest part of the dungeon, Spawn betrays them somehow, maybe, like, locks them in one of the cells, and then he goes on ahead to get to the spaceship. Maybe he even, like, finds a way to steal the symbiote off of Beatrice so that he can open the ship or something. I don't know how you would steal it off of her. Yeah, see, the thing is, if he has a way to get it off, then it's weird that he hasn't done it before. Well, but maybe it's not. He knows that anyone who's exposed to this thing is on a timer, right? He's letting Beatrice run out her clock. Maybe the mechanism for doing it is like something in one of the lower levels of the dungeon. That will work. And the other thing is that we can say that he told her, I didn't know how to get it off because I realized I could use you once I knew who you were to get us into the party. Yeah. He was going to get it off of her right away, but then realized that he could use her her connections, her her societal yeah. connections, and also sort of like not burn through his own sanity right. quite as quickly. It can be a combination of all three. And he uses something to get it off or either something in the dungeon that he finds or like fire or sound or whatever we decide its weakness is. Um, Maybe and he, he has gets like a piece of the ship or something. I feel like oh, yeah. he knows there's something down there that he can use to get it off. Yeah, yeah. A piece of the ship is a good idea. Like, what are the alien artifacts or something? Oh, and I like the idea that we could just say, like, the aliens that built the ship are, like, symbiotes. Because we haven't, like, necessarily said this. And they bond with, you know, people to 
do stuff. And so like in the past, they bonded with ancient humans or whatever. And that's why you need to have a symbiote in your interface or your mind gets blown up. Yeah. So he gets an alien device or whatever and like manages to get the symbiote off or gets it on. So he heads off with maybe some of his, some of the Sean Beans as well, the <laughs> remaining Sean Beans. And Carmen and Beatrice are left behind in some death trap. Okay. Is that the midpoint? That's midpoint because now we okay. have bad guys close in. I think that bad guys close in is the archaeologist catching up with them. Yeah, I agree. So any other scenes that we want to have in here, this is like another sort of fun and game section, but it's the it's the dark bad one where like there's actual consequences this time and things don't go quite as well. Do you think the archaeologist catches up to them and like sees them and kind of like gloats before going after Spawn? Or do we want to say that like if he gets to them, they're dead, so they have to get out before he does? It could be that Beatrice is somehow able to convince the archaeologist to let them out of the death trap. I'm just not sure this is the point in the story where she's kind of like, we're kind of trying to tell a story of growth with her. Yeah. And we know she can manipulate people. I feel like either they get put behind the eight ball because now the adventure is ahead of them or they have a time crunch and they have to get out before he catches up. I don't I don't know that I like her manipulating him. Right, because it's the same thing that we've seen her do before, like with the space. Yeah. Maybe they have the conversation and she, like, tries, but he fucking sees through it. Yeah, and so he just leaves them in the death trap and keeps going. Yes. So then maybe she uses a trick that Carmen Sandiego taught her in order to get out of well, the Car- death trap. Well, Carmen's with her, right? Uh, right, but, you know, maybe Carmen has has sort of, like, lost hope, or maybe Carmen even got knocked out when they were thrown into the death trap. Oh, okay. But Beatrice, like, uses something that Carmen taught her about picking a lock or escaping a death trap or, you know, something along those lines. And so she's able to get the both of them out. The death trap, by the way, it's a vat that is going to get slowly filled with poison dart frogs. Just saying. (laughs) Boy, it doesn't take a lot of poison dart frogs. No, it really doesn't. (laughs) What are we going to do with 3,000 of them? Um... (laughs) Oh, they all have the face of Sean Bean. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, these are the hallucination poison dart frogs. (laughs) For our all is lost moment, I kind of feel like it would be interesting here because we've already had like a few really bad things happen. I think it would be cool to have Beatrice have a chance to get out alive. Maybe even like Carmen wants to, they're like, they like cut their losses and leave and not go deeper in. But Beatrice knows if she does that, then like she just has to return to her normal life and she wants to like see what the alien stuff is and she's like curious about it so she ventures like deeper in how do we feel about that i I love that does that qualify as an all is lost moment yeah because the all is lost moment is her like contemplating leaving okay her like what starting to walk out after they escape the dungeon and then deciding no i don't want to and going back in yeah i mean it could even be the sort of thing where she connected with the symbiote while she was bonded to it and like she started to sympathize with it the symbiote just like wants to use this ship to go home But, like, she knows that if Spawn is able to get to the ship and open it up, he's just going to use it for his own ends. And, like, the the symbiote will never get to go home. And, you know, I think brains are pretty okay. Yeah, you know what? (laughs) So our break into Act 3, there's going to be some other crossing of some other threshold. And our character is going to go into some new final space where we're going to have our final confrontation. And this is another, like, you know, point of no return type thing. So I think that this is pretty clearly her, like, going into whatever the bottom level is, right? Yes, yeah, where the ship specifically is. Specifically as opposed to leaving when she has the chance. Yes. Totally. Now, yeah. the question is, does Carmen peace out at this point? Or does she convince Carmen to go with her? I, th- I, I think Carmen just died. Honestly, I think the fucking, I think Spawn killed her with the betrayal. Can we think Carmen Sandiego died, but then we find out at the very end she stole the concept of death? <laughs> it, it is it is super okay for characters to die, you guys. Not Carmen. <laughs> you kill Sean Bean. It's- <laughs> you kill Carmen Sandiego. That's what I he's mean, there we haven't, for. Yeah. We haven't cast this movie. I was going to suggest that Sean Bean also plays the Carmen role, but fine. <laughs> No, I I honestly think that whether or not we bring her back for a sequel, I think that for the purposes of this movie, it at the very least seems as though the Carmen character died in the betrayal. Okay, I got it. We established that she stole something from the Egyptian level. She stole a magic (laughs) onk that brings her back to life when she dies. So she dies in the death trap, and then she comes back. We will include that if there, a sequel gets ordered. That's the post credit sequence. I really like the post credit sequence idea. I am super okay with her coming back to life as long as for the, the for narrative reasons and to raise the stakes, she dies here. Okay, agreed. 
So the finale, now it's time for our final confrontation between the heroes and the villains. So what form is this going to take? Well, so it's sort of a three-way confrontation, right? It's it's yeah. Spawn with the symbiote, it's the archaeologist, and it's Beatrice. And they're all sort of like standing in front of this ship fighting over it. Or Wait, who's playing the archaeologist? This is very important. Don't say Sean Bean. <laughs> Timothy Dalton. Timothy <laughs> That's perfect. Okay. Yes, okay. absolutely, Timothy Dalton. So the, the obvious way to do it is to have it, once again, this is a little bit of a repeat of our Here There Be Dragons thing, but like we have the bad guy is bonded with the monster, but the monster doesn't like listen to them. Do we want to do that again? Or like, because I mean, that seems like the way to do it is that like somehow she gets the, the symbiote off of her and it rebonds with her and then she does the thing with the machine to like set the symbiote free. I, I feel like we already repeated something from that. We've established that being bonded to the symbiote for an extended period of time messes with your mind. What if Beatrice was bonded to it for so long that her mind has changed enough that being near the ship when it opens does nothing to her? Oh, her, yeah. Her perception has changed so much that she's able to look into the ship and be fine. But we can say that spawns doesn't because it's very new to him and that like idea that it would drive you crazy it actually just sort of like over time opens your mind up and makes you right, stronger great. against it but it doesn't have to be bonded to you right then that's fucking great because that really nails the MacGuffin down as the Ark of the Covenant because it opens and the hero doesn't die, but the villain does. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's sort of like Spawn misunderstood the way you open this thing. He saw the symbiote as a key, as a tool to be used in order to get what he wanted. But the symbiote is just another being. And if you open yourself up to it, the symbiote shows you the perception that you need. So Spawn was seeing this as just an object to be possessed and used. But what it really was, was an experience. And you have to learn from your experience. You know, you have to be open to growing and changing as a person. And that's just something that Spawn wasn't capable of doing. So is it because the Spawn character didn't actually have the symbiote for long enough? Long enough or like, and the relationship that you had was not like deep enough. Whereas we can apply like Beatrice got to know it and got to understand it and its wants and that kind of thing. Right. He could never have done it anyway. Right. Because keep in mind, he was trying to control it. She eventually decided to let it do its thing, which is the whole theme of the movie, is control versus allowing things to take their course and being okay with changing and being okay with not knowing everything. Yeah, I like that. Cool. I, I, th I think that fits really nicely. So what happens to the archaeologist, dude? Is it just Spawn that gets blown up or does he? And like, if so, why is the archaeologist guy down there? <laughs> like, if he I, knows... The well, he's trying to stop Spawn, right? Timothy Dalton and Spawn are like wrestling for control of the artifact when Beatrice shows up. Yeah, the archaeologist is coming down because he thinks he can take the symbiote back from Spawn. And so like, yeah, the two of them are fighting and maybe Beatrice like realizes how to open the ship. Yeah, I think Beatrice slides in, grabs the symbiote, and opens it. Yeah, no, she doesn't grab the symbiote. I think she just, like, walks up to it with no symbiote and, like, puts her hand on it, and it, like, opens oh, nice. it. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah, exactly. So, basically, it destroys both Timothy Dalton and Spawn, and then the symbiote maybe just, like, slithers right back over to Beatrice and just, like, rebonds with her. Oh, I feel like the symbiote should go back to its arc. Yeah, it, that's it, what it, it really it, wants. It, it, like, goes back in the spaceship, and the spaceship takes off, but it doesn't, like, rebond with her. E.T. phone home. Here's what I'm thinking. Maybe Beatrice goes along with it. This we could have a bit of a two thousand one like ambiguous ascension like into close heaven. Close encounters. Ending. Yeah, totally. She's just like, hey, I wanted to see some adventure. Let's uh, let's see what the stars have to offer. Let's eat all the brains. Let's eat I'm every brain from here to Alpha Centauri. Yeah, I, I dig that actually. For our closing image, is it her just like going off into space and there's weird pretty colors? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Post credit sequence: the Ark <laughs> reaches the mothership. Oh shit. Carmen San Diego's actually in the helm. <laughs> <laughs> Just inexplicably. <laughs> We're basically, I think, writing from the Pirates of the Caribbean school, which is end with a cool, weird thing that we don't know what it means yet, <laughs> and we'll figure it out in the next movie. Yeah, that's right. Is that our movie? That's our I movie. I think that's our movie. Now that we've finished and we're looking back on it, are there any revisions or additional scenes or threads that you guys want to like sprinkle in throughout the movie? I think that now that we kind of know how it resolves, the relationship between Beatrice and the symbiote has to emphasize the growth of their relationship with each other. And it has to right. be Beatrice relinquishing control 
to the symbiote and them having much more of a partnership. And we see I her agree. grow and change as this happens. Well, I think it would be cool if Spawn, if there's like a, maybe a, a trading montage thing where he tells her that you need to have like unbreakable will and force your will upon this thing and dominate it. And then you can make it do whatever you want. You have to not listen to the voices and not let it control you. You have to be in control of it. Yeah, that's pretty good. Like when they're planning the heist. Yeah. And then that works sometimes, but then she finds like, if she doesn't do that and she lets the voices into her mind, it can also work and it will listen to her, but it becomes more of like a two-way relationship. But then you have to just deal with like giving up some control and letting it into your mind a little bit, which was something he wasn't willing to do. Totally. All right. So roll credits. Every single person listed is Sean Bean. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. All Sean Beans were harmed during the making yes. of this movie. All we need now, guys, is a title. What are we feeling for this? How do you title like a pulp movie? Is it just like a ridiculously long specific title? Like, you know, the adventure of the whatever kind it, of thing? It's kind you know? of sensationalist. It's like the she-devils of Saturn or something right. like that. Sure. You know, or the lost temple of Kublai Khan or something. So like like the 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 black shadow of Atlantis or something? Yeah. Atlantis, though? Ah, that's where he's from. If we wanted to make it <laughs> space, it could be like, the Black Shadow of Aldebaran or something. Or From Beyond or whatever. I feel like the shadow from beyond might yeah. be cleaner. Yeah, I don't think we need the the repetitive color. Mm -hmm. like, like, try to think about like stuff that, like there's the Indiana Jones, like the Temple of Doom, the Last Crusade. Like, do we want to talk about the location a little bit? Yeah, it's, it's weird for us to have such a striking monster filled setting and not touch on it like we just touch on this one element of the of the setting, mm. or the, of the story the shadow the, sh the arc of the labyrinth the labyrinth of doom the the shadow from the labyrinth or the shadow of the labyrinth or something like that or i kind of like shadow of the labyrinth i oh, think that that I, works I, i'm okay with that one all right so shadow of the labyrinth then that, that sounds good yeah yeah and i like it brought to you by sean bean time for the kid thanks uh, first things first, we just got up the episode one transcript. Holy shit, the audio for that episode is bad. I had to re-listen to that. <laughs> but, oh, it was like a little walk down memory lane of Claire screaming, they invented time travel. Yep. <laughs> it was nice. So uh, please feel free to enjoy. And this way you can relive the magic without having to listen to that fucking audio. <laughs> uh, over to Twitter, thank you to Rafael Medina, Florian, Jake the Hank Prank. Duffy, Decade Fan, Matias Totimez, Sean Boyd, Mike Booch, and his podcast Politipop, Add a Son of a Gun, hey, Robert Ramsey, Tuning Japanese, Cosplay Fiend, Neil Butler, Bill Little, Jeff and Rick Present, and Hayden, who made a Discord group. Damn, that is a lot of people this Get time around. Get on it. Get on it. Over to Tumblr, thank you to FatBlonde69. FatBlonde69. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and Jeep Rhyme. And on Facebook, thank you to Duffy. Thank you, everyone, for sharing our bullshit. We also wanted to say that a couple of weeks ago on the Patreon, Megan Bob put up her bonus content for the month of May, which was a fan fiction story, the lead characters of which were voted on by our $5 and up patrons. The two characters were Adama from Battlestar Galactica <laughs> and Miss Frizzle from the Magic School Bus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I read this story, and it is the most amazingly beautiful story I've read in a long time, and I have been doing a lot of reading recently. Like, <laughs> Bob's other stuff has been very, very good. This is, like, transcendently good. <laughs> so any of you that are patrons, get on it. Check out that story. It is called What You Carry and What You Leave Behind. Uh, it was posted Jesus. on May 31st. If any of you are out there and are wondering whether or not it's worth becoming a $1 patron, man oh man, you get some real good Megan Bob stuff. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening to this week's episode of Smash Metafiction. We hope you enjoyed it. If you have uh, thoughts about Collaboratory or Smash Metafiction or whatever, please let us know. Next week, we are back with another Smash Fiction match, and it's going to be Toy Story versus Small Soldiers. Smash Metafiction is produced by Dan Mulcairin, with logo designed by Claire Mulcairin. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com for our theme song, The Builder. You can find us on Twitter at Smash Fic Podcast and search for the Smash Fiction Podcast on Facebook, 
Tumblr, and YouTube. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice, and if you leave us a good review, we shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Smash Fiction is made possible thanks to our supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash smashfictionpodcast. Please consider donating as little as a dollar each month. It helps us keep the show going, and we have great rewards and extra content for those who help us out. If you have any suggestions, feedback, or other contributions, send them to us at smashfictionpodcast at gmail.com and help us continue the fight. I didn't realize we actually had a giant cast of Sean. Yeah, they're all Sean Bean. <laughs> oh, God. God bless the makeup department for making them all look a little different. <laughs> There's, We have a Sean Bean with a mustache. We have a Sean Bean with glasses. Uh, the eye patch Sean Bean was my favorite. <laughs> I know. It's real sad when the duck killed him. <laughs> Yeah, there, was, there was a kappa in the Japanese floor. Oh, fuck yeah. Oh, no. That's a real bad way to die. All right, we Just, can't get into... Uh, the, how kappa kill me? We can't get into the intricacies of how kappa suck your blood out of your anus. <laughs> I wasn't going to okay. say Okay, moving on.